Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am happy to be with you on this Tuesday. I hope you had a great weekend. I had an amazing weekend. Uh, For those of you who have listened to the podcast for a while, you know that I grew up in Montana and haven't been home in a while. I love my family. Got to spend the weekend with them, a long weekend. Um, So that was Oh, it was it was amazing. I could I could spend the entire podcast just telling you stories about my family, but that's probably not what you tuned in to listen to. So suffice it to say, it was amazing. It was too short, but I soaked up as much um, knee snuggles and family love and just Montana goodness as as much as I could. And hopefully that will sustain me now going forward. <laughs> not that, you know, California is horrible or anything, but you got to soak up that family time when you can. And I definitely did. I even did an interview over the weekend uh, in Montana, discovered another Montana connection. Uh, the author that I'm interviewing today is Bruce Olive Solheim. And it turns out that he lived in Butte, Montana for a year. He went to Montana Tech there, which is uh, a school a school Um, which is yeah well it's a school in butte montana um so i'm always amazed at the montana connections or really even just the connections that i find i have with the authors that i interview i find it fascinating sometimes that there's so many connections that the world really is such a small place so interview today as you see from the title of the podcast it is a memoir Uh, The book is called Timeless, Deja Vu. It is the second memoir of probably a trilogy, probably three in the series. And I've done memoirs on the show before, and you know that I enjoy them. This is a memoir that's a little bit different, though, than ones that I have done before because the author, Bruce Solheim, has experiences with the paranormal, with the supernatural that many of us don't have or I shouldn't I shouldn't say that I shouldn't speak for you I have not really had and so it's an interesting insight into his experiences into his life I will say that while I am not 100% fully a believer in all things supernatural or paranormal I'm also not a non-believer I I just can't dismiss it completely. Um, Haven't had the definite experiences that could make me say, yes, absolutely, that is what I believe. But I haven't, I can't, I can't dismiss it out of hand either. There's too many things that happen in the world and I'm not willing to just dismiss that out of hand, like I said. So uh, it's fascinating. The book, it's really interesting to to read what he went through. Um, Hearing his experiences is interesting, just the way he he expresses himself, the way he talks about them, the way uh, he he grew up experiencing these things, and um, his mother also has has some psychic abilities, so she was able to talk to him about them or experience them with him, and so he wasn't alone in that. Um, just a really fascinating look at a life that I have not experienced and that's one of the things that I love about memoirs is that they give me a glimpse into lives where I don't don't have the same experiences so let me go ahead and give you the description of the book Solheim's first timeless book offered readers an entertaining chronological survey of his remarkable paranormal adventures Timeless Deja Vu goes further and deeper with 31 more stories of the paranormal and supernatural where you will experience the impact of Solheim's mediumship and encounters with spirits of all kinds, learn about a theoretical framework for understanding these phenomena, and even discover how aliens and ghosts have something in common. You will be introduced to his Nazi aunt, 
take a ride in his demonic car, meet his spirit animals, contemplate the wisdom of an ancient alien, and visit Elvis and John Wayne along the way. Dr. Solheim's new book is shocking, revealing, inspirational, frightening, humorous, and thought-provoking. Gary Dumm again provides his suburb illustrations. The paranormal professor strikes again. So, like I said, you know, I can't, I can't completely dismiss things out of hand. Not on, uh, 100% sure what I think about everything that I read in the book, but it is very well written. It is very entertaining. Um, there were a couple of parts that I, you know, I was like, hmm, definitely going to have to think about that more. And so if you, you know, if you're a fan of memoirs, then you should definitely check this out. Even if you aren't sure that you really believe in the paranormal or the supernatural or mediumship or aliens or what have you, you know, keeping an open mind and reading it to see what you think after you read it. Um, because for me, it was, it was very eye opening and, and having my conversation with Bruce was really interesting to just hear his experiences and what he's gone through. Um, I really, I really enjoy hearing people's stories. So I hope you will enjoy, uh, his stories as well. Uh, let's go ahead and turn now to that interview. Again, the book is Timeless Deja Vu and the author is Bruce Olive Solheim. Hi, Bruce. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, how are you doing, Sarah? I'm well, thank you so much. And I am excited to have you here to talk about your new book, Timeless Deja Vu. Before we talk about the book, though, um, I would love to just get to know you a little bit. If uh, you could share with my listeners a little something about yourself. Sure, sure. Happy to. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm a, the son of Norwegian immigrants that came to the United States to settled in Seattle uh, in 1948. They lived uh, during the Nazi occupation of Norway during World War II. Um, and uh, so it was me and my brother and my sister. My eldest brother died during the uh, occupation. So he would be like in his 70s now, um, <clears throat> or late 70s, actually. Um, and uh, I grew up in Seattle and uh, went to the University of Washington, dropped out, ended up in the Army. Uh, I did six years active duty in the Army. Um, I was a, a jail guard. I was also a helicopter pilot. Uh, after that, I went to work at Boeing. And uh, during this whole time, I picked up my bachelor's degree and my master's degree. And uh, working for Boeing, I decided I wanted to be a college professor, so I had to get my Ph.D. So I moved, to moved the family to Bowling Green, Ohio, and got my Ph.D. in history and uh, – so I, I got the job teaching here at Citrus College in 1998, and I've been there for 21 years teaching history. And um, so, yeah, a little bit of corporate experience, a little bit of military experience, um, and a lot of academic experience, and, and, and here I am. Yeah. And this, this whole time I've been uh, experiencing the paranormal, uh, so that's something that's just been happening since age four. Right, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. It sounds like from um, I haven't read the first book, but I read this the second one, and it mm -hmm. sounds like you just you lived in a, a million different places. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's talk about the paranormal experiences. Um, let's mm -hmm. actually start with that first book, Timeless, because that's your first memoir about those experiences. So yeah, um, tell us a little bit about the premise of that book. Yeah, the idea was well that it was inspired by my friend, and I, he would uh, and he's always looking over my shoulder, my friend Gene who uh, passed on, unfortunately, in 2016. He was a childhood friend, also Norwegian-American. He was an actor, just a wonderful human being. And it was very sad when he passed away uh, of cancer. And uh, he came to me in a vision about a month after his passing and um, very clear vision, which wasn't unusual for me to have these visions and talk to those that have passed on. But uh, this one was very special. He had a very special purpose, which was to tell me that it's time to publish all my stories, all the paranormal stories, and especially my connection with him, you know, because he wants to be the star. He's an actor. So you know that. <laughs> so he's the star of the show. And he is. And uh, he gives me advice all the time. And he even gave me the title of the book, Timeless. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it, I already had the material because I've been having paranormal experiences since I was four. Uh, and uh, so it was just a matter of having the courage uh, to publish it. And uh, Gene gave me that nudge and told me it'll be okay. And of course, my big fear was, I'm an academic, and people won't take me seriously, you know, I'll, I'll get 
retired early and nobody will want to publish me anymore and, you know, I'll be mm-hmm. ridiculed by my peers and my students alike. And uh, I, I couldn't have been more wrong. Those fears were just unfounded. Although there are there are people who do ridicule, but you know they're yes. so few and far between that it doesn't really phase me. So uh, so that's how so uh, thirty four stories uh, arranged chronologically uh, from age four uh, in nineteen sixty two until um, you know just just recently, mm-hmm. and uh, and it ranges everything from ghosts and uh, you know to angels and demons and uh, precognition and telepathy and telekinesis, you know, just everything. I'm kind of a paranormal lightning rod. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it. You, yeah. you so often hear more um, kind of just one area rather than, mm-hmm. you know, and, and your stories really encompass a wide variety. Yeah. Um, before uh, you and Gene had this conversation and he encouraged you to publish, how open were you with people about your experiences? Uh, for a few members of the family or people who expressed an interest, I would share a couple things. And, uh, but other than that, I, I didn't really talk too much about it to, to, to people because I, I, you know, you just never know what people's reaction is going to be. And I wanted to be taken seriously as a teacher and as a professor and a, and a writer. And, and, um, I didn't want to go into that realm. I just didn't know how important it was to me. I, I always in the back of my mind, I knew it was important and, my my mother was psychic, so I grew up with that, the acceptance of it in that regard from her. But my father was very skeptical and didn't like any of that kind of, as he would have called it, monkey business. You know, he doesn't mm-hmm. like any of that. Very serious, uh, you know, carpenter, blue collar guy. And my mom and I would do uh, mind reading things with cards, like a deck of cards. And he would let us do it for a while. And then he'd tell us to knock it off because he didn't <laughs> like it. So yeah. then she'd wink at me and I'd go, okay, mom knows that I know that we're what we're doing here right, is real. Right. So it was, it was kind of an interesting upbringing. And, and frankly, my, my wife, Ginger, she, um, she's skeptical too, which is I think kind of interesting because it keeps me grounded. I think it's a good thing. Not that she's not supportive because she's very supportive of what I'm doing and the writing and so forth. But she just says, you know, I, I don't have these experiences. So I believe you are, but you know, it, she just keeps me very grounded, which is good because if, I'm surrounded by people who are having experiences all the time that you kind of lose touch with uh, the world that we have to live in day to day. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things where if you don't experience yourself, it's kind of like, okay. I mean, I, you know, I know you and I trust you and I believe you, but I've never had that. So I can't quite relate. Yeah. And, 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 and that's my friend, Gene. He was the one who told me, you know, to, um, to have an experience is to believe and to believe is to have more experiences. So what it does is once you have an experience, it opens the floodgates and you're going to continue to have them. And it's just, there's no way to get around it, you know? Yeah. Or as I said, and I think the beginning of the first book, I said that it's not that I believe in ghosts, it's that they believe in me. So I don't have a choice. Right. Right. They, they I have to deal with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so did you know at the time of writing the first book that you wanted to do a follow up or did that, that kind of come about later? It, uh, I guess it was in the, the back of my mind that I would do it. And now it's very clear. I've already, uh, you know, I'm already on halfway through the third one. So it's a trilogy. And, uh, and that's, I guess, fitting that it would be a trilogy. And I already know the name for the third book. I'm going to call it Timeless Trinity. So it's going to be very spiritual and, uh, and go a little bit further. Each book goes a little bit further. The first one, I, 34 stories, you know, a lot of interesting, odd experiences and paranormal experiences, but I didn't go into the more bizarre ones. And the second one, I went into some that I, I well, I kind of wanted to test the waters with the first book, see how people would react. Cause I was, you know, out on a limb, I thought anyway, so I wasn't going to present everything. I was going to hold some stuff back. So the second book, Deja Vu, I share a little bit more of, uh, of the uh, more unusual things and uh, in- including alien type stuff, which is this, you know, it's funny, but people will say, oh, yeah, I, you know, I believe in ghosts. And you talked about, well, aliens, how about that? Oh, no, I don't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> right, so right. I had to test the waters first. And um, so, I, I, yeah, I think it became clear after I finished the first one that there were much, many more stories. So I had to do a second one. And then I knew I was going to do a third one. So and we'll see after that. 
I'm going to jump in here so we can take our first break of the podcast. But see, there's already two books and numerous stories for you to read. Uh, you know, maybe you're already a believer and so you want to hear Bruce's experiences. Maybe you're a little skeptical. Well, there are all of these opportunities to read his memoirs in two different books with a third one coming that give you um, some a really good chance to just see what you think. So, um we're going to take, as I said, that first break of the podcast. And when we come back, we'll be talking more about Bruce's experiences and his writing, etc. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well, Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast, your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Bruce Olaf Solheim about his second book, Timeless Deja Vu. Well, actually, um, he's written multiple books. This just happens to be the second book in his um, Timeless series. So let's go ahead and get back to that interview with Bruce. So how you, you've kind of touched on this a little bit, but <laughs> how was writing the second one um, different or similar from writing the first one because you, you know you'd had the first one experience you kind of got that out of the way was it easier was it um how was it how was that experience yeah the first one i included a lot of stuff i'd already written about but never shared so i had you know stored away i'd written these these stories and they're kind of like vignettes they have uh, you know they have a moral to them they're kind of a beginning a middle and an end they have their own little arc each one and they're arranged chronologically and the, the second book I had to reach deeper into my subconscious and and flesh out some of the stories that I had that I hadn't really totally written about and some of the ones that I had held back because I wanted to you know wait and then uh, so it's kind of a combination of those two things and and then things keep happening you know since the first book so I included some of those things including the the last story which is um, the the one that uh, is is going to probably shock people the most this idea that I have communicated with a uh, with an ancient alien, mm-hmm. and uh, and that I continue to 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 hold that contact, and uh, so I I kind of bring readers along for the ride and see how many are with me at the end of the tour. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Right. So the the first one was kind of, you know, testing the waters and seeing yeah. how it would be accepted. Mm-hmm. Um, so as you've moved through, how did you decide which stories to include? Like that first one, I, I understand it was kind of, you know, um, mm-hmm. a little bit experimental. So then with the second and third, did you have um, more of an arc in mind in terms of what stories to include? Yeah, and it is it is an arc. It's in my see because as I'm releasing these stories and writing these stories, I'm it's a uh, it's a very therapeutic process uh, for myself and my spiritual growth. I I, I consider um, when I had that experience with Gene to be kind of a spiritual reawakening for me, and uh, that's when I decided to start to try to deliberately uh, have paranormal experiences rather than my whole life it had just been random and uh and frequent but very random you know i didn't know when it was going to happen it sometimes happened at the weirdest times and so i started to learn uh and and read a lot more about how i could maybe uh you know control these things more and then i learned how to do that through what i call walking meditation i can contact the spirit world and and protect myself which is another really important thing before in my whole life up to that point I didn't know how to turn it on and I didn't know how to turn it off. Now I know how to turn it on and turn it off, which is a, a big skill set right there, <laughs> kind of a steep mm-hmm. learning curve. And so that the second book kind of deals more with that, that process. And, and it gets more personal. It gets pretty, I write about things that are quite painful, some of them. And, and, and that's okay. I think uh, if you're not going to take some chances as a writer, why bother? 
You know, mm, mm-hmm. if you're not revealing yourself, especially in, in this kind of stuff, you know, people aren't going to be interested if you're just sugarcoating everything and just making it, you know, I mean, who's interested in the story where everybody's happy and they live in happy town, you know, that, right. that's, that's not so great. So it's just a real life. It just happens to be a paranormal life, which I really think is not, you know, my idea is that the paranormal is really, it's really just normal. And mm-hmm. the supernatural, the supernatural is just natural. Yeah. And we've just forgotten since we yeah. were ancient people. Yeah. And you talk a lot about, um, you know, you haven't had always an easy life. Everyone has their different mm-hmm. paths. So talk about how those experiences with the, the paranormal or the supernatural have really helped to guide you on, on your, your path through life. Yeah. Well, it, the, because uh, it, the, the lessons I tend to have tended to learn have been very uh, amplified because of my uh, paranormal connection. Or as I say, it's like I'm walking around with a big radar dish on top of my head and I didn't mm-hmm. even know how to turn it on or off. And, and so everything was amplified, you know, and the mistakes were amplified. Successes were sometimes amplified too, but, and I didn't quite under, understand it. So trying to get a hold of that and understand, well, what does it all mean? So that, that is really the arc is trying to figure out really who I am and why I'm here and trying to uh, make this work for the greater good, you know, cause what I've figured out through contacting the spirit world, those that have passed on, you know, they, they, the, the important lesson I've learned is that um, the purpose of our life here on earth is to alleviate the suffering of others in whatever way we can. Some of us are storytellers. Some of us are entertainers. Some of us, uh, you know, work in soup kitchens, you know, whatever you do, that that's what we're supposed to be doing because the afterlife is so beautiful and wonderful. And this is what Jean has told me and others have told me that you almost wish, well, why do I want to be here when I could just go there? Well, the reason mm-hmm. is we got to help people. Mm-hmm. We got to, we got to do these things before we, we, you know, take that leap. And, uh, and it's nothing to be afraid of. That's the other theme in these books that kind of carries through is that, that there's really nothing to be afraid of. And people live in fear of death so much that, that they don't really live their lives and they don't accomplish their mission, which is to alleviate the suffering of others. Yeah. And I, I, I would imagine that fear can often be at the, the root of some of that skepticism that you encounter. Um, so yes. Yes. Yeah. I think everybody has experiences. Some people deny them. Some people are afraid of them and they just don't want to you know, talk about it or deal with it. And that's, you know, to suppress it is what they think is one way to make make sure it doesn't happen. And in, and in a sense, if you deny your experiences, then of course you're not going to believe it. Right. So you just can't accept it. How have you, um, how have you dealt with those encounters with skeptics? I, you know, I actually enjoy skeptics because I, I feel like that's part of my uh, uh, mission is to, is to help them and, and not so much like, Oh, you're wrong, but just to listen to them and say, well, you know, maybe have you ever thought of this? Have you ever thought of that? And and then if they are very, you know, put up a wall, I say, okay, that's that's fine. You know, don't I won't mention it again. I did have a skeptic, uh, actually a colleague of mine, take a my first paranormal class. I teach a paranormal class at the at the uh, my college, which is a whole other story in and of itself. But that they allowed me to do that. Mm-hmm. But. But uh, he took the class and he was, a, uh, you know, a science guy, science math guy, you know, very uh, fact oriented and came in as a skeptic. And by the time the class was over, he was asking me uh, about the spirit of his cat, who he encounters all the time. His cat oh, wow. passed away. So, yeah. so <laughs> did you start right? Did you start teaching the class before or after you wrote the first book? Uh, after after the book came out, I okay. uh, so I've taught it. Uh, let's see, last fall was the first class, and I've just completed the uh, the spring class. So we had a winter class too. So I've had three sessions of it so far, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I and I I I knew that was part of my mission. And Gene was the one who pushed me into that too. He said, "Not only write the book, you're going to teach a class too." And I said, "Really? <laughs> I got to teach the class? Yeah, you got to teach the class. You got to share bossy. them." Share the may he's he's very he's very nice but he's he's very uh yeah he, he can push <laughs> he can push but in a good for your own good right. so so I went to the administration just thinking they'll say no you know I just said you know I want to teach this paranormal class and then, you know maybe you won't like it what you know that kind of thing and no they jumped all over it and mind you it's it had to go all the way through the board of trustees and the president of the college to be approved 
Now, the board of trustees at most universities and colleges, these aren't people who make random wild decisions. You know, these Mm -hmm. are people who, you know, very thoughtful and very conservative, not in the political sense, but conservative in the sense of the reputation of the college and all that. And they, no, they were totally approved. And, and so, yeah, it, it's, um, it's been a very interesting uh, experience. And, and my thing with teaching in all the years I've been teaching um, is that that's the best way to learn is to teach because mm-hmm. you learn from your students. Absolutely. They ask such good questions and you see how limited your knowledge is and how much further you have to go. Just when you think, oh, I got a good beat on things, student will ask you a question. And you go, oh, my God, I don't know anything about this. I better <laughs> right. go back, and, back to the drawing board. Right. How, how big are the classes? Well, the first one had 35 people. The second one had 20. This last one had 13. But I didn't, I advertised in the first one. I didn't advertise the other two. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I'm going to do a better job of advertising uh, in the fall. And there's a lot more interest in the fall, too, because of Halloween. People really get excited. So you kind of use that as your marketing tool. And for for books, too. I mean, that's, you know, when the big season for this kind of paranormal supernatural stuff. Yeah. The fall. Yeah. So you're currently working on the third book, but I know you, yeah. you know, as an academic, you do other writings. You also are a playwright. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit about some of the other things that you write. Yeah. I've, I've, I've published eight books and uh, two of them are paranormal books. So the other, the other six are um, ranging from a uh, U.S. history survey. I don't call it a textbook. I call it an anti-textbook because it's very personal. Everything I do is very personal. It's my take on history, that all history is personal. Yes. And uh, so I, I, wrote, I wrote the anti-textbook that I use in my classes because I got tired of using other ones. And I've written some uh, scholarly monographs on, like, uh, women leaders, two of those. Uh, one on the uh, Vietnam War, the United States and the Vietnam War, with the personal history section in that one, too. And uh, other stuff about foreign policy in the Nordic region. Uh, that's where I did my dissertation research in in Norway in the archives there. And uh, mm-hmm. so so those are the kind of things I've been writing, very serious academic topic. Not that what I do now is not serious, but, you know, more traditional, I guess, academic topics. And then the, the playwriting came about because a friend of mine uh, committed suicide in 2002, and he was a, a Vietnam veteran. And uh, I struggled with a way to present his story because he had such a compelling story. And um, he, uh, uh, it came to me in a, in a vision, so once again using my paranormal stuff, uh, that it should be a play. The only problem was I'd never written a play, and this was a very serious topic about suicide. And, and then I learned you know, that uh, 22 veterans commit suicide every day in America. Yeah. And I was just appalled by that statistic. And I said, that's, that's something that people need to know about. And I can tell it through the story, the life story of my friend who just committed suicide. So it was very personal. And it's like with all my writing, it's always compelled. I have to write it. I, I don't like sit down and say, it'll be really nice to write about, you know, a field of poppies and how nice that is. You know, it's always some problem or some issue or something that is just is just compelling me to, to write it. Or, you know, in the case of Gene, telling me I have to write it. You know? mm-hmm. But I'm always I'm always compelled to, to write something. And then uh, so that was the first play. I did. It was a steep learning curve, learning how to write a play. And uh, I had some good mentors. And it got produced at our college, and then it got uh, uh, two awards from the uh, Kennedy Center uh, American College Theater Festival, and then it was produced in Los Angeles. And, uh, yeah, it was very successful, and now the, some people in Los Angeles want to produce it again. They've been in contact with me. And um, so that was the first play right out of the, the shoot there. It, so I, I knew I was on to something, and I, and I like playwriting. So I wrote a couple more, and I've had one more produced that was produced in, in here um, at the college and also in Norway. We were invited by the uh, government of Norway to go uh, uh, put on the play for them. And uh, we got funding for it and everything. And, and uh, so I took 15 students with me and the producer and the director, and we went and, and put on the play in Northern Norway in the town where the action of the play took, took place. And it's a play based on my, my family's experience living under Nazi occupation. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so that's it. Just everything has a, a, a reason and a, a there's, I'm compelled to, to write it. So I've written 10 plays, uh, two have been produced and 
I'm hoping the the third one, which is actually a children's play, gets produced. It's uh, I wrote the, a, a children's book called Ali's Bees. It's a, a novel, a short novel for uh, middle grade readers. And I turned that into a play. So I'm hoping that gets produced next. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I love playwriting. I'm very verbal, you know, <laughs> so it's just, uh, it just, and I, uh, I kind of see that how the structure of the plays work and, and it seems to fit my style of writing. I've tried to do screenwriting. I can't do it. I just, it's not my thing. Mm-hmm. I, I just, uh, even though I'm very visual, you know, I, I like to use illustrations in my books and so forth, but it's just something about it. It's very technical. It's more technical than I thought it was. And playwriting is very verbal. You know, it's just mm-hmm. a lot of dialogue and setting it up right. And right. it's just, uh, yeah, I just, it lends itself better to the writing style that I have. So I, I, I enjoy all kinds of writing. And, and I don't know exactly what's going to come up next. I, I do know what, besides the uh, Timeless Trinity, the, 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 the completion of the trilogy, I am doing a comic book with the same illustrator, Gary Dumb who uh, was one of the primary illustrators for Harvey Picar and his American Splendor comic book series that was made into a movie with Paul Giamatti and I forgot the other actress, but anyway. um, So I work with him and we're doing a comic book and um, that I've always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so, so I, who knows what's going to be next. Right. (laughs) And it is time to take our second break of the podcast. I am fascinated by, well, I'm fascinated by people who can write, as you know, um, and who can write well and interestingly, and then people who write in multiple genres, you know, whether that's um, screenplays or plays or even multiple genres of fiction, nonfiction, young adult, children's books, whatever. I, I just think that's really amazing. So Yay, authors. Good job. Uh, You have my absolute respect. (laughs) Um, On that note, we are going to take our second break of the podcast. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion to my interview with Bruce Olive Solheim. You brought up the illustrators because I I wanted to talk about there are illustrations in the books. Um, Yes. You said you're very visual. So is that pretty much where that came from? What made you, you know, a lot of a lot of books don't have illustrations (laughs) for adults, but it's kind of fun, you know, to have those in there. What made you decide to add illustrations? Well, that's really what got me so excited about reading was comic books. So I've always, lo- I've been, I'm a kind of a frustrated comic book artist, and uh, the comic book that I'm doing with with Gary right now is based on a comic strip that I uh, wrote in the uh, uh, Technocrat newspaper when I was in in Butte at Montana Tech. That's why oh. I dropped I dropped out of Butte mainly because I was spending all my time writing the comic strip, which was very popular at the school at the time. Now that's being revived as a full blown comic book. So you never know what's going to come back. Yeah. But um, so I, I, I am very visual in that sense. And, and I, I, I don't accept my artwork. So I, I want to get a, a really good artist and, and Gary Dumb is just a, he's been illustrating since the early seventies and underground and, and, you know, kind of an underground comic book artist at first and more, uh, you know, kind of esoteric stuff. And he's done horror stuff. He's done a lot of different things, but he's just an excellent 
uh, artist. And so, and we get along really well. He, I, I think you need both. And I, I remember those old books my mom used to have in the bookshelf that like these old fables and stuff, you know, I mm-hmm. remember reading those and they always had illustrations in there somewhere. And it was always so interesting to me to see an illustration and, and if it's done right, you know, like if it not being totally, uh, um, you know, redundant of what's in the written word, but actually adds to it. Mm-hmm. That's the way I look at it. And that's the way Gary looks at it too. We work kind of hand in glove with the, the stories. He, I don't tell him what to illustrate. I mean, I might give him some ideas, but he comes up with the illustration and it's always something I wouldn't have thought of. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like two minds producing, uh, you know, kind of doubling down on each story, which I, I love it. I love the collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like you've been writing in some capacity for a while. Is it something yeah. that you've always done or did it come about a little later in life? No, it started early at age eight. I was making my own little books. I remember, you know, block printing because I never learned how to do cursive mm, and, and trying and illustrations with it and uh, and stapling it together and giving it to my mom and saying, look, I I wrote a book. And then at age 10, I think it was, my parents got me a typewriter. It was an old manual typewriter. And I just started writing. You know, I, I love words and I just loved writing, you know, typing the words, you know. And uh, my dad, because he didn't uh, write in English, he would say, can you type this for me? It was some, you know, some contract, you know, because he was a carpenter. So maybe it was a something he had to write, you know, about to the city or something. Mm-hmm. And he a- asked me to write it. So I would, you know, my little typewriter, I'd write it out for him. So I think they knew that I was going to be a writer and that they, they really encouraged that. Mm-hmm. Oh, provided cool. me with the, I remember taking typing classes and I was, uh, you know, one of the few boys in the class yeah. taking the typing class, but man, what, I mean, then my parents knew, you know, they knew what I was supposed to do. So they helped me with that. Right. That's wonderful. Um, out of your own experience then, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of books out there about how to write this and how to write that. And, and they're wonderful. You know, a lot of technical, good stuff, good advice. But it really has to come from deep down inside. Like I said, you have to be compelled to to write something and write something that you really are passionate and feel deeply about and that it probably starts with some kind of problem or dilemma or something. You just, you can't, it won't let go of you. And the only way you can let go of it is to follow through the process and let it guide you. And that's, you know, just give in to the process. And, and like when you're writing fiction, the characters come alive for you and they speak to you and they kind of take over the story, which is kind of fun at the point when it's no longer just you, it's you and the characters writing mm-hmm. and they're making sense. You know what, you know, like they'll say, Oh, I wouldn't do that. This is what I would do. And then you have to listen to them. And usually they're right, you know, and, and, um, I know it sounds schizophrenic, but anyway, that's that's. <laughs> oh no! Kind of, most of my authors talk about that how the the characters yeah. make decisions for themselves. You have to you have to give into it, and then uh, with with nonfiction, it's just having some kind of uh, sense. Some you know you mentioned an arc. Uh, I think that's really important, so you don't just have random thoughts, real as though they may be. You know, real events. You have to have some kind of structure to it. So I think having written plays kind of helps me with that too. You know, and, and having, you know, being a historian, so everything's chronological and, you know, that kind of stuff. So it, that kind of structure has helped me with my nonfiction writing. And, um, and you know, they always say, historians always say, ab- abandon chronology at your own peril. You know, mm-hmm. so I think, because that, that is its arc. It's a story, you know, that's your, your arc as a person. And um, yeah. so I, I, that's, that would be my advice. And just, and be willing to take chances, chances, dig deep. Don't be afraid, you know. Don't wait until, you know, a gene comes up and, and pushes you. You, know, you can <laughs> right. do it before that if you want to. Right. And and don't be afraid because that's people who took chances. You know, these are the classic authors, you know, like uh, or playwrights. Like I always think of Henrik Ibsen who wrote about, you know, strong women characters that people just thought was horrible. You know, how could a, a woman leave her husband and be the hero of the story, you know, and stuff. Like, and, and he was way ahead of his time because he took chances. Mm-hmm. So. That's so funny that you bring him up because my 13 year old niece and I just looked him up yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's, it's wonderful. So I, you know, there's that, that Norwegian tradition too. And I, yeah. so, and I've been in his house. I I did a tour when I was in Austin. 
been in his house a couple of times that he lived in in Oslo just to get inspiration and it was mm-hmm. inspirational so mm-hmm. all those kinds of things that you know go to the place you're writing about and stay there and just touch things and be around it and pick up on things and that's yeah I mean if you're writing fiction and let's say it's set in New Hampshire or something you know go to New Hampshire if you've never been there and and walk around and the story will come out it'll form right, uh, right. yeah um, how about reading? Do you have favorite genres or authors that you like to read? I, I do all kinds of reading. I, you know, I, I have to, cause I teach American history and I have a great interest in political science and science. You know, I, I read articles all the time and stay on top of current events, but my favorite like authors, uh, you know, somewhat traditional in a way. I really love Mark Twain. I love Mark Twain for his folksiness and his humor and uh, I, I love Theodore Sturgeon because I'm big, I was a big science fiction fan, and, and he wrote some of the most bizarre episodes of the uh, original Star Trek, and his short stories are very bizarre and kind of thinking out of the box. And Ray Bradbury, because of the, the fantasy worlds that he could create, and the, you know, I, just, I just admired him and, and Kurt Vonnegut because uh, he took a lot of chances in his writing. And uh, so those are my favorites, some of my favorite authors. I have a lot of favorite authors, but those are just a few of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, I know you have a website, so Mm -hmm. tell people where they can find your website as well as where they can find you on social media. Yeah, so uh, bruceolavsolheim.com. And my middle name is spelled Mm O-L-A-V and last name S O L. H E I M. So Bruce Solheim dot Bruce Olaf Solheim dot com. I'm also on uh, um, Twitter, and I think that's just Bruce O Solheim. And I'm also on Facebook. If you just look up Bruce Solheim, you'll find me there. Or Timeless Paranormal. Either one of those will show up for uh, in Facebook. Okay. So those are the only things. I don't do any of the other ones really. Right. Okay. No, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. And we've talked about you know a lot of different topics today, but is Mm -hmm. there anything else that we haven't touched on that you would like for people to know about you or your books or your experiences? Yeah, I just, uh, I, I, I just mainly want people to, uh, to, you know, to realize that we do, we all have a a very special purpose and to not be afraid uh, of, of death because nobody knows when that's going to happen. And, and, and even when it does, it's okay. You know, those people that I talk to, like Gene, he's doing great, you know. So, and uh, so, to not be afraid to live and to and to do do our part in, in helping uh, helping people because that's why we're here. And uh, and be as you know, be as creative as you know. Take a chance with your creativity for those authors out there. Just take a chance on being the best you that you can be in your writing, and, mm-hmm. and people will people will come to it. They'll. That's what people like. They, they, they can spot a phony right off. You know, mm-hmm. people can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So the first two books are out. Um, yeah. They, they are available now. Uh, do you have a, an estimate on when the third one will be out? Uh, next year. It'll okay. be out next year sometime. Yeah. Okay. So people yeah. can, can start with that first two and then look forward to the third one. Yeah. Um, and I and really... the comic book should be out oh, yeah. next year, too. <laughs> yeah. That's so it, it, it'll all be on my website. They can find updates on stuff there too. So. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk to me. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Sarah. I enjoyed our conversation. Thank you once again to Bruce for taking the time to be on the podcast and talk about his memoirs. Uh, again, they are Timeless and Timeless Deja Vu. The third book, Timeless Trinity, will be out sometime probably next year. But um, yeah, really interesting. I, I enjoyed our conversation. I enjoyed hearing about his experiences. And I enjoyed the book. Um, again, it made me think. You know, that's the best part about it. Whether or not I believe absolutely 100% everything that happened or not even believe but can kind of wrap my brain around because I I don't want to dismiss that these experiences happened and um, they you know that that the Bruce experienced these things it's just that I haven't so it's harder you know you, you don't have that that connection but to be able to talk to someone and hear their experiences and then figure out, wow, how does that change how I view the world? How does that change um, what I have come to think of the world? That's what books do for me is they open my eyes to experiences that I have not had um, and 
allow me to explore things that I might not have thought about before. Um, so thank you to Bruce for sharing his experiences. Thank you to authors for opening our eyes, broadening our minds, giving us experiences that we've never had. I find that to be the wonderful thing about books. I hope you're having a wonderful week. Um, it is Tuesday, although I I can't. I keep saying maybe I'm too old to take weekend trips because I'm exhausted. I, I just spent so much time hanging out with family that now all I want to do is sleep. Um, but it was a wonderful weekend, as I said, and I'm so glad that I got to do it. Now, now I'm just going to have to take the week to recover. But I hope your week is going well, and I hope that part of that week involves reading. You know, get out there, get lost in a good book, and join me next time for some more discussions of wonderful books and experiences that we all may or may not have had. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.